Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar, Beyond Breast Cancer Awareness, a panel discussion on advancements in breast cancer genetics, research, and treatment, brought to you by the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey in collaboration with the Rutgers University Alumni Association. Uh, as you saw, everyone will be automatically muted for tonight. Uh, a lot of questions have been submitted in advance, so the panelists will do their best to address all of those questions. If you have additional questions as the event goes on, feel free to submit those questions via the Q&A function, uh, but please be aware that we may not be able to get to all of the questions. We will do our best, uh, but there will be um, an ability to have your questions answered after the event. So now it is my privilege to introduce our moderator this evening, Associate Director and Distinguished Professor at the Rutgers Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine, Dr. Ann Stock. Thank you, Kieran. It's a pleasure for me to be participating in the webinar this evening. In addition to my role as a faculty member in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, I have several additional affiliations with the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. As a researcher, I am a non-resident member of Rutgers Cancer Institute. As a donor, I am a member of the Cancer Institute's Director's Leadership Council. And perhaps most relevant to this evening, I've been a patient at CINJ for two independent occurrences of breast cancer in 1997 and 2008. Perhaps I will have time to tell you a little more about that later, but right now I want to introduce you to CINJ and our panelists for this evening. Our panel features a number of experts from Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, the state's only comprehensive cancer center as designated by the National Cancer Institute of the National Institutes of Health. Collaborative care from an NCI center is an important resource for patients. At Rutgers Cancer Institute, patients have access to broader experts through our collaboration with RWJ Barnabas Health. They have access to clinical trials not available elsewhere, and they have access to new treatments developed through on-site research at CINJ. As I just mentioned, Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey is the state's only National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center. This is a designation and recognition that we are very proud to hold. The prestigious NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center designation is held by only 51 centers across the nation. Having such a center is especially important for New Jersey, which is the country's most densely populated state and the fourth most ethnically diverse. The coveted NCI designation is granted competitively to institutions that demonstrate outstanding scientific leadership and the depth and breadth of an exemplary track record of research discoveries in basic, clinical, and population science, all with a focus on translating these discoveries to benefit patients. Researchers from Rutgers Cancer Institute have made outstanding scientific contribution towards the national goal of reducing the incidence of cancer and improving the outcomes for the thousands of individuals diagnosed with cancer every year. This distinction translates into the best possible care for patients. When treated at an NCI designated compre comprehensive cancer center like Rutgers Cancer Institute in collaboration with RWJ Barnabas Health, Patients have access to innovative clinical research, exceptional patient care, and advanced technologies. Rutgers Cancer Institute coordinates basic clinical and population research through five comprehensive research programs comprised of faculty from both Rutgers University and Princeton University. These programs are supported not only by highly competitive peer-reviewed grants, but also by philanthropic support and partnerships with industry. We are going to be hearing about some of the contributions of these programs to advancing the treatment of breast cancer this evening from our panelists. Joining us this evening, we are very happy to have with us Dr. Deborah Topmeyer, 
who is chief medical officer, chief of the division of medical oncology and director of the Stacy Goldstein Breast Center at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Dr. Sridhar Ganesan, who is Associate Director for Translational Science, Section Chief of Molecular Oncology, and Omar Bore Chair in Genomic Science at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And also we have Sherry Grummet, who is a Genetic Counselor and the Life Center Program Director at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. I would like to start by having our panelists give us a brief overview of advances in breast cancer in their areas of expertise. Deb, we'll start with you and your perspective on breast cancer treatment. Oops. Dr. Tomer, unmute please. Ah, I thought you would unmute. Okay, hi, I, <laughs> um, the challenges of Zoom. Um, delightful to be here tonight and to um, share this panel with my esteemed colleagues and to discuss what makes Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey really so outstanding. I've really had the pleasure of being here for actually, um, October was 25 years I've been at Rutgers um, and I've seen tremendous growth over the course of the past 25 years when the institution um, was really um, started as part of a P20 planning grant from the NIH and headed by Bill Height who was recruited by Yale and now uh, as the and has so eloquently described one of 51 NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers. Um, being uh, around the block several times, I also have a different perspective on uh, breast cancer today and breast cancer from years ago. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes discussing that, um, but I just wanna come back to the importance of clinical care at a cancer center. Uh, many times, individuals think, well, it's a cancer center, it's an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center, and all we do is research, and that individuals and patients are not valued in the same way because it is a research institute. I would say it's quite the opposite. We work in a multi, for example, in the breast center and in other of our tumor study groups, we work in a very multidisciplinary way. We are not siloed from our breast surgeons, our radiation oncologists, our medical oncologists. We all work collaboratively to drive the science initiatives and working with individuals like Dr. Ganesan um, that drives the, the basic science piece of this and translates it into the clinic and back from the clinic into the laboratory is what really provides such outstanding care to patients because of these scientific discoveries. Um, and I am very proud to be part of the institution where research is our mission. It is, it is the driver for why we are here because we want to make a difference. And because of research, because of science, we are so far ahead of where we were many years ago in terms of not only breast cancer, but lung cancer, GI cancers, let alone hematologic malignancies. We have made incredible advances. So as I said, as uh, someone who has been a, a breast oncologist for over 25 years, I just wanna take you on a journey from let's say 1995 to now. Years ago, our approach to breast cancer was a one size fits all approach. We'd see a patient, she'd have a tumor, the NIH came out with, the NCI came out with the recommendation back in the early 1990s that any woman with a one centimeter breast cancer should be offered chemotherapy. So that whole concept that it was anatomic stage and nothing else that really drove treatment decisions really has fallen by the wayside. We have really come far around from a one size fits all approach to a very targeted approach in the treatment of breast cancer. And one of the most important understandings we have about breast cancer today is that breast cancer is not one disease, but rather a spectrum of diseases. And it is defined by certain molecular differences 
that we can now target specific therapies to that have really changed the natural history of the disease, not only in early breast cancer with fewer women relapsing later on in life from recurrence, but allowing women with stage four disease to live long lives with their disease. Breast cancer for a certain patient population has really become a chronic disease. Understanding the enemy, the molecular drivers for cell growth in these different subtypes of breast cancer has opened the door to a clinical armamentarium of clinical options that we have in the treatment of breast cancer. And it's not just chemotherapy. It is monoclonal antibodies. It's other targeted therapies that impact the cell cycle um, that uh, doesn't allow the cell to continue its growth pattern when given it in combination with endocrine therapy. There, there are specific advances that Treater will speak to in triple negative disease in the ER positive population, um, in the HER2 positive population. Over the course of the last year, the FDA has approved two new agents in the treatment of a certain subclass of breast cancer called HER2 overexpressing breast cancer that has again changed the landscape of this disease. So it is a better understanding of the molecular drivers causing the cell growth that has opened the door to the advances that we have made in the treatment of the disease. And it has allowed us to win small battle after small battle, but we have never gotten our eye off the fact that we want to win this war. And in addition to having this wide number of, of new um, options in the treatment of the different subclasses of breast cancer, we also have gotten much smarter in terms of who to treat in, with regards to chemotherapy. And I would think that in addition to this clinical armamentarium of novel agents, the fact that we also are much more discriminating and selective in who we treat with chemotherapy has been a huge advance in the treatment of breast cancer. So I'm going to end with a, a patient that I saw today that really illustrates this point. This is a young 40 year old patient that I saw who was diagnosed with a relatively large breast cancer and three positive lymph nodes were identified and the more cancer and involvement of the lymph nodes places one's risk of relapse somewhat higher. And even a year or two ago, we would have automatically said, this woman needs chemotherapy and then we'll give her hormonal therapy. And then of course she will get radiation to the chest wall. But because we have certain tests now that have been validated um, in, in breast cancer, this is a test called Oncotype where it is a genetic profile of the cancer that is the expression of which is placed in a mathematical model that generates a quote recurrence score, we are able to select those patients who benefit from chemotherapy and who do not. This score is both prognostic and it is predictive. So a few years ago, we would have given this patient chemotherapy. She would have had all those side effects of chemotherapy. And subsequently we would have given her tamoxifen to, to, um, as a hormonal blockade. But now we know that not only can we step up her hormonal therapy by understanding the importance of not only giving her tamoxifen or another hormone blocking agent, but rather suppressing her ovarian function is also critical in her tumor not recurring. And we also know that coupling her hormonal therapy with a novel drug, this class of CDK4-6 inhibitors that you may have heard about on TV, that it's called Ibrands, um, that you can actually mitigate the risk of recurrence by combining this in the adjuvant setting, not Ibrands, but a drug very, very similar to Ibrands that was just the data which was just presented a few weeks ago at one of our major conferences. So whereas years ago, we would have given her chemotherapy because one size fits all, we know the type of breast cancer that she has, 
does not necessarily respond well to chemotherapy. And we also know because of the gene profile of her tumor that chemotherapy would not be effective. So even though we are concerned about her three positive lymph nodes, we know from other studies of maximizing hormonal blockade that we can alter the risk of recurrence in this particular patient. And furthermore, by giving a, a bisphosphonate that women take for osteoporosis, for example, we can also mitigate the risk of osseous metastases. So we have come a very long way, we have indeed, and it is the science that has driven the progress. And many times, and I just wanna uh, you know, just take this moment to say, many times it's, it's small philanthropic grants that we, that we are, the monies of which we were able to use for small pilot projects and parlay that into a larger um, NIH grant, for example, that really makes a difference. And without those initial pilot projects that were funded by you know, philanthropic individuals, many of you are in the audience, we would not be where we are today. And the patient that I just described to you may still be getting chemotherapy and not the optimal hormonal therapy for the treatment of her disease. So with that said, Again, just to summarize the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to cancer care, and that includes our surgeons, our radiation oncologists, our medical oncologists, working collaboratively with our physician scientists. That is what makes a difference and brings research to life. So with that, I will turn it over to Anne, who will turn it over to Sridhar. Deb, thanks so much. That was really wonderful. Um, we're actually going to move on to Sherry. And uh, Sherry, perhaps you can give us an overview of the impact genetics has on breast cancer risk and how that knowledge is informing and driving breast cancer research and treatment. Yes, thank you for having me here tonight. And thank you for attending. Um, so my name is Sherry Grumat. I'm a genetic counselor at the Life Center at the Cancer Institute. And I've been there a little over two years, but I've actually been an oncology genetic counselor for the past 22 years. And the, the field of cancer genetics has just exploded, especially in the last five to 10 years. Next slide, please. So I often get asked, what does a genetic counselor do? And genetic counselors are healthcare providers who have specialized training in basic science, genetics, counseling, and family communication. And we work closely with patients and of course families to help them learn more about genetics and mm -hmm. the risk of developing cancer, to understand the available genetic testing options and whether genetic testing is appropriate for them to understand the genetic test results once they are returned and to help them use those results in deciding which healthcare decisions they want to make regarding screening and risk reduction. And of course, providing emotional and psychosocial support for the patient and their family. And so we've been fortunate enough to have four full-time genetic counselors at the Life Center in addition to um, Rutgers started a genetic counseling master's degree program four years ago. And so we're fortunate to have students as well working with us. Um, our four genetic counselors cover uh, four different sites. So we cover New Brunswick, Somerset, Hamilton, and Princeton. And there are four other genetic counselors that work in the RWJ Barnabas system. Um, CINJ, uh, genetic counselors, we actually do not charge for any of these visits. We wanted to reduce the barriers associated with insurance billing and paying out of pocket. So this is a, a service that we offer to our patients and to the community members. And uh, we found that that's very successful in trying to reach underserved populations in the area. And as Dr. Topmeyer had mentioned, one of the focuses of the Life Center is to support research. And we all work as a team. 
Um, one of the areas that we work with is precision medicine, which is targeted treatments based on genetic mutations seen in, in cancers. And so we know that learning from hereditary cancers can also um, enhance the research done in precision medicine. We also work with um, looking at different delivery methods for genetic counseling and testing. As I mentioned, there's a total of eight genetic counselors between Rutgers Cancer Institute and RWJ Barnabas. And there's so many patients that we need to reach. So we're looking at different methods to deliver this information using telemedicine, possibly uh, using pre-test genetic counseling videos, and uh, you know, trying to better reach underserved populations as well using these alternative methods. And also we're trying to find methods to promote cascade testing in families. And what that means is that we find um, that a family member has a genetic mutation and we want to help them facilitate communication within the family so that other family members are fully informed and have access to that testing as well. Next slide, please. So one common question that I get is who should consider genetic counseling and testing? And one of the most important things to remember is that 90% of breast cancers and most cancers actually happen sporadically or happen by chance. And only 10% of breast cancers are actually hereditary. And hereditary cancer means that there's a genetic alteration or mutation that's being passed through the family and that mutation can increase the risk for certain types of cancers. And so these are some characteristics that we tend to see in families that have a mutation in a, a breast cancer risk gene. Um, oftentimes we see cancers diagnosed at young ages. So under the age of 50, we can sometimes see breast cancer in the late 20s, 30s, early 40s. If the woman is diagnosed with multiple cancers, so breast cancer in both breasts, for example, if we see multiple cases of the same cancer in the family, so multiple cases of breast cancer in the family, and then oftentimes we can sometimes see rarer cancers like men developing breast cancer and pancreatic cancers. And then we look for certain clusters of cancers. So the most well-known genes are the BRCA1 and 2 genes, or some people refer to them as the BRCA genes. And we know that there's a high risk of breast cancer associated with those genes, but we also see a high risk of ovarian cancer. And so if we see the combination of those cancers in the family, then that family is a little bit more likely to have one of these genes. Next slide, please. So why is it so important to identify patients and families that have hereditary cancer? As I mentioned, these cancers can happen at younger ages. Oftentimes we're not screening women at that age. And so it's very important that we identify women so that they can take advantage of screening methods at a younger age. So we not only use mammograms, but we use other types of screening methods as well, such as breast MRI. And so using these different methods, we can hopefully find cancer at an early stage in younger women. We also can take advantage of risk-reducing methods. Um, some women consider risk-reducing mastectomy to greatly reduce the risk of their cancer. If a woman knows that they have a high risk of ovarian cancer, they may choose to have those ovaries removed later on in life after they're done having children. And also this helps identify family members who are at risk. So many women come in, they've had breast cancer, they're very worried about their sisters, their daughters. And so in many cases, genetic testing can help identify who is at risk, but also who is not at risk. So that can also um, relieve some anxiety for some family members that have this family history. And through studying families that have hereditary cancer, we're learning about better treatment options that may be available to patients with certain hereditary genetic mutations. So using BRCA1 and 2 as an, as an example, we've recently found that there's a certain medication called a PARP inhibitor that is very effective in treating these cancers. 
And now we're learning that possibly cancers that have similar biologies may also react, um, be um, effective in using the PARP inhibitors. So this might not be just important for hereditary breast cancers and ovarian cancers. It may be applied to sporadic breast and ovarian cancers with similar biology. Next slide. So in, in summary, cancer genetics has really uh, moved forward in the last, um, especially five years. Um, we used to just test BRCA1 and 2 in the past, and now we're moving forward and testing many more breast and ovarian cancer genes and finding even more families that have hereditary cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Shridhar, can you give us your perspective on advances in breast cancer research? Sure. It's a real pleasure to be here and, uh, um, uh, and great to be with the, uh, with the fellow speakers here today and have the opportunity to present uh, the work that we're doing here at the Rutgers Cancer Institute, as well as with our research colleagues throughout the United States and the world. And so, you know, one of the major advances in the treatment of cancer in general is what Dr. Topmeyer has put out is that, you know, um, in the old days, we used to classify cancer merely by, you know, where it arose in your body and what it looked like under a microscope. So if the lump rose in the breast, it would be breast cancer. If it rose in the lung, lung it would be lung cancer. And then treatment was really guided as a one-size-fits-all treatment uh, for kind of the organ it came into. Breast cancer has advanced early on in, in the early realization that, hey, you know, breast cancer is not one disease, but a collection of very distinct diseases. And as Dr. Topmeyer pointed out, we used initially markers like the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, and the gene HER2 to, class, to classify breast cancer into to smaller subgroups. And that's really changed you know, how we treat uh, uh, breast cancer. As an example, that subset of breast cancers that has HER2 amplification used to be considered the worst prognosis breast cancer. And now with the development of treatments uh, over the past you know, uh, several decades and even more recently, uh, this has now become, in fact, amongst the breast, best breast prognosis breast cancers, showing how treatments really have changed the natural history of that subset. But in addition to these simple classifications, we realize we have a lot more work to do in further defining what drives the growth of each individual cancer. And the idea is even two ER positive or two ER, ER2 amplified breast cancers may be quite different and behave differently in two different women. And part of that is that they may have very different underlying pattern of changes that drive their growth, like changes in the DNA in the tumor present in their growth. And what has really been um, a major advance is in the old days, in order to go and try and figure out what are the exact genetic changes in an individual person's tumor, used to be an enormous uh, um, uh, endeavor that took you know years, years of time and millions of dollars. And now we can do that you know in weeks uh, at reasonable prices and available. To, uh, uh, and the technology is now widely available, and so now we can actually in real time analyze what makes your cancer different than anyone else's cancer. And can we figure out ways to figure out what drives its growth and put really treatments that affect not cancer as general, but actually the cancer that you have. And this technology is very exciting and just trying to come into play. And it's already starting to have its effect in certain cancers in which now the treatment is almost completely defined, not by where the cancer arose and what it looks like under the microscope, but the gen genetic changes that are driving it. And I think breast cancer is uh, is the, our approach to and treatment of breast cancer is also slowly starting to change by the development of these technologies. Um, for example, within ER positive breast cancers, there is a subset that have a mutation in a gene called PR3 kinase. And we've known that for a long while. But recently, drugs have come along that have started to target that gene mutation. And it's present only in a subset of ER positive breast cancers, but those women who have that, now clinical trials have shown respond to specific treatments that target that mutation. And again, whether you respond or whether you should be treated with this mutation is not determined by what the tumor looks like on the microscope or even whether it's ER positive, but whether or not the mutation is present or not, all right? And that's the tip of the iceberg of the kind of changes and treatments that we hope are coming down the line. And we're also asking, asking other questions, not just developing new treatments, is when should we not treat? You know, we figured out as Dr. Tottmeyer says, hey, you know, for a long time we treated everything with, every, we treated everyone with everything. <laughs> And now we're realizing, hey, who really benefits and which women can be spared treatments? 
all right, uh, that aren't effective for them. And that's also a major uh, advance that's coming along. Uh, as Dr. Um, Totmer says, we now routinely use uh, uh, um, genetic profile individual cancers to figure out who can be spared chemotherapy in subsets of women who have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and who most will benefit the most from it also, you know? And that way we spare the therapy to those who will benefit most uh, uh, from it. Uh, and those kind of analyses, again, are just, are just starting to come in. We're just trying to figure out, you know, for example, you know, even in HER2, who benefits most from the target therapy? Who can we give less treatment to and still do well? And those are important questions. We not only want to expand treatment, but limit it to only those who are it's going to be effective. And even though we talk a lot about the treatment of cancer, another important thing is that the same technology of genetic, of genetic analysis uh, and things is also ultimately going to be applied to uh, hopefully early detection and then prevention. All right. Uh, and so, um, and those are very forward seeking right now. We don't have those tools, but we're develop, working hard to develop them. But we'd love to sit there and say, hey, can we figure out, use these new genetic approaches to figure out better who is at risk? Who, who, how can we better detect them? And then how can we minimally and most effectively treat or prevent these uh, uh, diseases, All right? I think the landscape is really changing, has already changed over the past 10 years. And I expect the further accelerate of the next 10 years. This is one of the most exciting times to really, to be in cancer research, even though it's a tough uh, area, because I think we're gonna see uh, uh, significant changes uh, over the next decades. And I'm hopeful for like the, if there are students in the audience that when you're, when you go and you become uh, physicians, you look back in horror what we did 20 years ago uh, in our treatment of cancer compared to what you guys are gonna be doing. All right, with that, I'll stop. Okay. Thanks, Sridhar. The advances our panelists have just covered are changing treatment options for thousands of people diagnosed with breast cancer. For me, as a breast cancer survivor, the impact is quite tangible and personal. My experience as a cancer patient at Rutgers Cancer Institute led my husband and me to become involved in philanthropic activities at CINJ. As I mentioned, I'm currently a member of the Director's Leadership Council, which allows me an opportunity to spread the word about this gem that we have in New Jersey and to participate in fundraising to support uh, different initiatives at the center. It's a small way for me to give back to an institute that has done so much for me and a way that I can help ensure that Rutgers Cancer Institute is able to continue to provide such help to others. Convenient access to high quality care close to home was very important when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Not having to travel out of state for care eliminated a major hassle at a time that I had plenty else to deal with. And it was a major factor that allowed me to continue working during cancer treatment. But it's the Cancer Institute's involvement in research that translates into cutting edge care for patients that I feel most strongly about. My experience with two similar cases of breast cancer a decade apart provided me with a firsthand perspective on advances in cancer treatment that Dr. Topmeyer Top just mentioned earlier. In the first occurrence in 1997, I undertook an onerous course of chemotherapy that was at the time the standard recommended course of treatment. When I was diagnosed with a second occurrence of breast cancer in 2008, the implementation of Oncotype DX tumor profiling, which characterized 21 genes from tumor tissue, provided a more detailed description of the molecular profile of my disease and the score allowed at that time a best guess to be made about the benefits of different treatment options. Fortunately, this allowed me uh, to avoid chemotherapy in my second battle with cancer. But now, a decade later, um, with clinical trials finished, we can actually make more than just a best guess about what patients will benefit from chemotherapy using the Oncotype DX scores. And uh, we now have an evidence-based approach to giving the best possible care to patients. So research that makes such advances possible is a long and expensive process. Biomedical research typically begins with initial observations and ideas of how they can be translated for the benefit of patients. Once an idea is well-developed and preliminary data have been accumulated to demonstrate the feasibility of the project, an investigator can compete for federal grant support 
to fund investigations, often securing research support in the million dollar range, but relatively small amounts of funding for the truly innovative phase of the project where new ideas are explored and developed is much more difficult to find. And this is one special area where philanthropy can have an enormous impact. Since its inception, Rutgers Cancer Institute has used gifts to fund seed projects and collaborative projects that bring together investigators with different expertise to get promising translational research ideas off the ground that subsequently can be parlayed into projects that garner millions of dollars in grant support from the National Cancer Institute. This research has been successfully translated to patients through clinical trials and contributes to our collective knowledge on cancer and to help inform future research. We're really fortunate to have this NCI designated comprehensive cancer center here at Rutgers. And now we'll tap into the expertise of our CINJ panelists to answer some of the questions that have been submitted by participants in tonight's webinar. We'll begin with a question for Dr. Topmeyer. And the question is, I hear more and more stories from breast cancer patients and survivors that if they did not have an MRI, their breast cancer would not have been detected. Tumors were not picked up in previous mammograms. The New England Journal of Medicine published a clinical study citing the importance of MRIs in detecting more breast cancer in women with dense breasts. Can you discuss the role of MRIs in breast cancer detection? Yes, thank you for the, the question. Um, certainly MRI screening is appropriate for certain patients, individuals who have been identified, for example, with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, um, other mutations as well that confer an increased risk for the future development of breast cancer. But the problem with MRI screening is that although it is quite sensitive, it is less specific. And in that study, the false positive rate was really quite high, greater than 70%. So although in that study, there were more what's called, quote, interval cancers found, so cancers that typically would not have been found with just routine mammography alone, the majority of those were actually non-invasive breast cancers or actually well-differentiated cancers that would not have been probably problematic in the future. And so the real trade-off here is the increased cost, the anxiety, the need for biopsy, when we don't know that the identifying these interval cancers has had an impact in overall survival. And we just don't know that. Um, once again, I think in your very high-risk population, right, a screening test is only as good as what is the incidence of disease in a population. But it is just in a very high-risk population, it makes a lot more sense sense than in the general population where we know where breast cancer rates are and many of the cancers that will be found would have done just fine if they were identified on mammogram. So once again, many times surgeons will incorporate MRI into surgical planning. Um, you know, there are many indications for MRI, but I would say as a general screening tool for the, for the general population, not at increased risk, um, it, it is not ready for prime time, and there are certainly drawbacks. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Ganesan. What are the latest ad advances to treat metastatic breast cancer? And another question, what treatment is available for the combination of ER and triple negative breast cancer? Um, well, there are many advances for treatment of, uh, of metastatic breast cancer. Again, it depends on exactly the kind of metastatic breast cancer you have. Um, and so I can touch on some of them. One of the big things that's really been uh, coming is the use of immunotherapy for advanced breast cancer. And there's a role of that in a subset of triple negative breast cancer has been shown to when combined with chemotherapy has some, has some efficacy. And that's very exciting because uh, you know there's been very few advances in the treatment of, of triple negative breast cancer or breast cancer that doesn't respond to hormonal therapy or HER2 target therapy. Uh, and immunotherapy, which has had a big um, part in improving outcome in many other cancers, is just starting to have an impact in breast cancer. And I think that's going to be an interesting you know, uh, avenue to follow, even though I think 
um, it's going to be limited again to a subset of breast cancers. And we need to really identify which uh, women are gonna benefit most from immun immunotherapy and which one should be spared the side effects if they're not gonna have benefit. And I think that's gonna be a major um, um, avenue of uh, where we, we're doing a lot of research into and I think will generate a lot of excitement. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Topmeyer, we have another question about screening. Can you address the controversy on self-breast exams? Right, um, that, is, that is a controversial area, but I would say it's a relatively cheap exam to do. Um, and it is the same rationale that, you know, we don't recommend MRI screening. So let me, let me come back to this. So, once again, when women feel something in their breast, it leads many times to, you know, seeking attention. And this sounds counterintuitive. I, I appreciate that, you know, um, seeing the position that then, you know, may order a special, you know, a mammogram, ultrasound, a biopsy, et cetera. But I will tell you, um, although there was a very, very large um, study performed in China, which did not show an impact on um, survival, I would say that most a, a fair number of women feel something abnormal in their breast, which then prompts them to to seek evaluation. Now, there's a big difference between you know, oh, something felt a little funny here. I saw something here versus doing a formal monthly breast self-exam. That being said, it is one thing where I just, um, I have not gotten on that, hey, it doesn't work train. Um, and I think it is important to be familiar with your breast exam, particularly patients who are at increased risk. Um, I just had a patient today, for example, who I treated 15 years ago. She was pregnant at the time, she had a BRCA2 mutation, 15 years out, and she thought this wasn't coming back. And she said, you know, I just felt something on my reconstructed breast. And, you know, if she wasn't aware of her, you know, reconstructed breasts and what they feel like, she would not have brought that to my attention. And she does have a recurrence. So uh, once again, I think it is counterintuitive. I wouldn't, um, you know, I, I think the data are the data. I'm not going to argue with them, but I also know that women find abnormalities, lymph nodes, new findings on their breasts, um, you know, a lesion on their chest wall that they bring to our attention, which many times in the setting of having a prior breast cancer leads to uh, the, the diagnosis of a recurrence. So um, I agree that the data are not compelling for breast self-exam, but I certainly don't discourage it. Thank you. Dr. Ganesan, is there a role for targeted therapy in breast cancer? And if so, what are the most interesting targets? So breast cancer, current, current uh, therapy in breast cancer is mostly targeted. So in terms of, you know, um, all the hormonal therapy is targeted towards the hormone responsive breast cancers. HER2 target therapy is targeted towards HER2. Uh, what we're lacking is, is in the triple negative where we don't have targets, but we're trying to identify new targets uh, in that disease uh, right now. In terms of oncoming targets, there are plenty of targets that are coming in, especially genomic targets. So I mentioned the PI3 kinase mutation that's seen within a ER positive. So now there are drugs that have just been approved and more that are coming down the pipeline. There are other genomic alterations. Um, even within HER2, the classic alteration is HER2 amplification. And now specific mutations that won't be picked up by our standard assays are now also shown to be present in a subset of breast cancers and sensitive to a certain HER2 targeted therapies. Um, and uh, within triple negative, we and others are working to identify unusual um, uh, changes that are seen actually, in, uh, that are also seen in other kinds of cancer types uh, like lung and uh, thyroid cancer that are present within breast that may, that uh, within a small subset of triple negative breast cancers and they may be responsive to that. So I think there's gonna be uh, a growing role for targets, targeted therapeutics in breast cancer. And I think the, uh, the most important role is we're trying to identify the targets in the triple negative breast cancer, but right now, present, we don't have identified targets uh, there. But I think there's a lot of interesting work going on uh, in that. And I think, uh, you know, stay tuned. I think in the next two years, we're gonna see a lot of interesting things. And Treedar, maybe, I know this is a breast cancer talk, but maybe you could speak to the changes in the treatment of lung cancer. Absolutely. So I think, you know, uh, in the old days, 
you know, lung cancer was, you know, I still is divided into you know, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer, basically on the size of the cells. And within non-small cell lung cancer, which used to be treated only with chemotherapy, now all of a sudden it's about 2% have mutations in, in a gene called EGFR and those respond really well, actually, actually 10%. You know, 2% have mutations in ALK, another 2% have mutations in another gene. Each one of those small subsets responds uh, and, and only those respond to specific target therapeutics uh, against that, you know? So for example, in lung cancer, 4% that have the mutations in a gene called ALK respond to the ALK inhibitors, but 96% don't because they don't have the mutation, right? Uh, and so is that a lung cancer drug? No, it's an ALK drug. Similarly, within triple negative breast cancer, I think it's gonna fall apart into lots of little uh, uh, groups that have specific targets. And I think that's gonna be the change that's coming forward. Thank you. Let's switch to um, a genetics question. Sherry, can you, um, can you tell us, are there any recommendations for adult children of BRCA2 positive patients? Yes, so um, with BRCA2, we see this higher risk of breast cancer for women. And uh, usually we start screening at the age of 25 for women. And we also see a higher risk of ovarian cancer, which is usually addressed after childbearing, um, usually after the age of 40. And also it's important to remember the men in the family as well. We see a higher risk of male breast cancer and prostate cancer, usually after the age of 35 to 40. So for adult children, it's important to communicate this information to their children and have them go for individualized genetic counseling so that they can learn about the risks, learn about the screening and risk reduction options that are available to them. And they can then decide for themselves when is the appropriate time for them to have testing and also what type of screening and risk reduction methods are right for them. And what might be right for them at the age of 25 might be different at the age of 40. So life circumstances, of course, always play into decisions that are made. And so that's why individual counseling is so important. Thank you. Dr. Ganesan, how does the GARDEN360 test help metastatic cancer? Sridhar, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, here we go. Ah, so GARN360 is one of the new what we call liquid biopsies. And so normally in order to get a sample of the tumor DNA, we have to take a biopsy, put a needle into the tumor, take out cells and analyze the DNA. Now we realize that in some patients, the, the DNA from the tumor is actually released into blood. And with the appropriate technology, we can actually capture the tumor DNA in blood specimens and analyze those. And um, GARDEN360, as well as several other uh, uh, assays are now available that can capture tumor DNA in a standard blood specimen and then do it uh, and then send it for analysis to look for specific mutations that mm -hmm. can be analyzed. Again, for example, in the case of the PR3 kinase mutation for which there are now specific treatments, one of the ways that I recently diagnosed the presence of this in one of our patients is not to re-biopsy the patient but to actually send the blood test. And then by that, see if uh, I can detect that mutation and that then use that as a way to guide treatment. That kind of approach is now very common in lung cancer and others where there's lots of targets like we mentioned before, and we think that will play a role. The second role for these kind of things is that ultimately this may be a universal tumor marker. We can follow the presence of mutations in blood as perhaps a, a, um, uh, a way to track how much tumor is left in the body instead of doing scans or in addition to doing scans. And this may help us both in early and late stage breast cancer to really understand how effective our treatments are and whether we can really get rid of evidence of the tumor being present or not. Thank you. We have another question for um, Dr. Topmeyer. Can you talk about the effectiveness of tamoxifen? Well, tamoxifen, you know, when you talk about 
targets, right? The estrogen receptor is one of the oldest targets in the treatment of breast cancer and dates back well over a hundred years ago when surgeons had some sense that breast cancer was hormonal in nature. And after they did a disfiguring uh, radical mastectomy on women and kind of lopped their ovaries out too. And for those women who had tumors that were driven by estrogen, they actually did quite well for those who did not like the triple negative, they did not do so well. Back in the 1970s, a drug called tamoxifen was developed that actually blocks at the receptor of the, um, on the nucleus of the cell and at the estrogen receptor. So estrogen can't sit on that receptor and drive the growth of the tumor through generating a downstream signaling cascade. And although, the drug in postmenopausal women have been supplanted by um, a, a class of drugs called aromatase inhibitors. There are some real benefits of tamoxifen over the aromatase inhibitors, including um, better bone health, uh, fewer uh, your genital symptoms, um, although there is a, a increased risk of mildly increased risk of uterine cancer um, and blood clots. But it has been a very effective treatment. And back in, I believe it was 1998, and Triadar, correct me if I'm wrong, this very much changed the natural history of premenopausal breast cancer because tamoxifen was never given for premenopausal women. And through a very, very large meta-analysis um, that was done with, with hundreds and thousands of women, we learned that tamoxifen was an incredibly important component. As I described this young woman to you today, not giving her tamoxifen and just giving her chemotherapy would have had a very devastating effect on her overall prognosis. So although tamoxifen, you know, people talk about, oh, it's toxic, it's this, it's that, it is really a, a very effective drug and probably the most prescribed internationally prescribed drug and simple to take and cheap. You can get it, you know, a three month supply at Walmart for $9. And for certain patients that can't afford some of the more novel therapies, this is a big deal. And although they've been compared in head to head comparisons to aromatase inhibitors, fewer women relapse on the aromatase inhibitors, but there's been no difference yet in overall survival. So although people think tamoxifen premenopausal, aromatase inhibitor for postmenopausal women, I use them in both settings. So to answer the question, very effective. Thanks. Um, so I think we have time for, for one more question and we'll make this one a population science question for Sherry. Is alcohol a risk for breast cancer? And if so, how much is too much? <laughs> so yes, there have been some studies that show that alcohol consumption can increase the risk of breast cancer. And I don't wanna rain on everybody's parade and say that you can't, you know, shouldn't be drinking. Of course, we all know that alcohol in moderation is of course fine. Um, how much is too much? I believe that they've determined that for women, um, one glass of wine per day is safe. Um, in excess of that, it becomes a little bit um, excessive. Um, so I think you have to, you know, see what your alcohol consumption is. If it's over seven drinks, I guess, per week, then maybe considering um, reducing that a little bit. But yes, there has been some association, but of course, some alcohol does have a little bit of benefits in relaxing us. And, and of course, red wine is, is always um, good as well. So particularly during COVID. Yes, <laughs> that's I, yeah, absolutely. We need a little bit of relaxation at this time. So maybe we'll try to, to squeeze in one more question before we um, wrap up. Uh, Dr. Kottmeyer, <laughs> uh, I wonder if you can give us um, a, a short discussion on equity in breast cancer survival. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think we all know that 
there are individuals, particularly um, African Americans, Hispanics, that don't have the same access to care that that other individuals have. And there is true disparities. And within the Cancer Institute, within population science, we're exploring, um, you know, we have a, a, a very comprehensive program in disparities research. But even interestingly, stage for stage, for example, breast cancer in African American women, who, you know, when you adjust in economically for all the same factors, they actually do worse. And as we've been talking about tonight, what is the difference in the population where their outcomes are worse? Or what, what is it that we can possibly impact where we can make a difference within this group? So um, certainly one of the reasons I'm so proud to work at Rutgers Cancer Institute is we don't discriminate on the patients regarding the patients we see. If you are undocumented, if you are uninsured, if you are underinsured, we will see you. Um, and I think the the hope is, and there are other programs where, such as C program, where we can offer mammographic screening and other screenings as well. Uh, Anita Kenny at our institution is also doing um, a significant amount of work looking at colorectal screenings, for example, particularly in Southern Jersey. So all of this work is really important to make sure that every individual can have access to care. Um, this is critically important because even today in the setting of COVID, fewer and fewer women and men are undergoing screening. And in fact, the diagnoses of breast cancer has dropped by 52%. That doesn't mean the incidence has dropped, it's the diagnosis has dropped. And why? Because women aren't getting screened. We want to make sure that every woman has access to screening, whether they have insurance, whether they don't have insurance. And again, there are significant barriers in the underserved community that many of us don't battle with. Um, and the fact that at CINJ, our doors are open to everyone, I think speaks volume to who we are as a state institution, cancer institution that we serve all New Jerseyans. That's a really nice note to end on. Thank you very much. We've come to the end of our hour and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So we'll be wrapping up right now, but first I really want to thank our panelists for lending their expertise to tonight's discussion. And also thanks to all of you for your participation this evening. The large number of participants uh, clearly indicates that the topic is, is of interest to many, I think. In case there are unanswered questions, additional questions, or requests for more information, we're providing a contact email address for you to follow up with. And this is on the slide right now. So please don't hesitate to drop us a line and someone will get in touch. And thanks again for joining us.